Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. Um, today's Tuesday and that means that we're talking about certain specific tarantula science topics or certain specific tarantula pet trade and hobby topics. Um, you read the title already so that means you know what this video is all about. Actually I would like to explain how the different genera work, why do you need a genus, why are there several different genera and how do we put them different species uh, within these uh, different genera. So it is not extremely scientific so I try to break it down as easily and easy to understand for each and everybody out there. Um, it's not a yeah, specific video regarding scientific names and common names. I personally use scientific names, but uh, there's nothing wrong with using common names. There's so many tarantula enthusiasts out there. It's just normal when there are several different people using different names. I totally understand that common names are much easier to use if you're in the hobby and within a region where they're just used properly. Um, here in Switzerland we don't use any common names so I didn't have even the chance to like try to to uh, learn them so anyway let's don't. start then yes yeah, so you're going to see a short example I try to illustrate and draw so my drawing skills are not the best but uh, actually this is genus one and uh, species number one so I would like to showcase how the different species are changing but uh, the genus one actually is defined with this uh, yellow um, marked part on the abdomen of the spider that should illustrate the fact that this genus has two separate urticating hair patches this is quite common actually several uh, genera have that and it's used as a distinguishing um, feature for a genus for example, Frixotrichus has it, uh, you've seen some footage on this channel before. There is Bistriopelma from Peru, for example, some Hemiragus species has it. It is a used feature, that's why I used it in my example. Um, the green part you can see on the first pair of legs should illustrate a certain feature all members of this genus have. Um, we can think about a patch of a lot of thorns maybe so this green patch on this first pair of leg illustrates the fact that they have a yeah many 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 different uh, spikes there so each and every species of this genus needs to have both of these features to be within this genus so in the end it all summarizes to the fact that a genus is yeah, nothing more than shared traits which leads to a possible common ancestor. When you go on the right side, uh, we have uh, established a genus number two. This one has this green field of uh, urticating hair patches on the opisthosoma and has two dots on the fangs left and right so that means each and every species who has these two features needs to be within genus 2 easy so we are going a little bit further and uh, see how it further translates so genus 1 species 1 on the left side you're seeing a picture um, which is the tibia apophysis for males like the tibial spurs they have little hooks on the first pair of legs so when they are mating with the females um, they can like put the fangs uh, into these kind of spurs so the male is a little bit more safe but uh, genus one species one has normal tibial spurs but genus one species two as you can see in this example, has 15, 20 spines on this tibial spur. 
So in the end, they have a lot of shared morphological traits, but all the traits they share are the genus definition. So think about this way. Um, example two. Yeah, so think about this way. Example two, we have uh, genus number two, species one. They have only these uh, spines on the fangs, the red dots, left and right. And they have this big urticating field of hair on the abdomen. Okay. But uh, species number one furthermore has the bulbous, which looks like this. Species number two of the very same genus shares all the morphological trait on the picture. They do have these two um, red dots on the fangs and they do have this big patch of urticating hairs on the abdomen, but their bulb on the male, major male, it is completely different. Um, I tried to make some markings here so they don't have these connected part on the left side of the bulb and also the curvature is non-existent. For example, species one has a curvature and species two don't. So this actually separates species from each other, but they're still in the very same genus because they share the same morphological traits to be, yeah, which is establishing or defining um, this genus. So I hope it is somewhat clear now how or why there are different genera out there. For example, Haplopelma, Syriopagopus, Ornithoctonus. These are all fossorial tarantulas from Southeast Asia, but they do have each and every single one of their own features, morphological features, which this species group shares. So for example, all Hoplopelma have distinctive features together, just as in this example. So another example is this. Think about the newly established genus Caribena for our beloved um, Avicularia versicolor and Avicularia laeta. So I'm drawing here a very easy, easy to understand um, illustration. So on the left side, we do have a circle which is called Caribena laeta. And on the right side, there is the circle called yeah, Caribena versicolor. And these are the two species, but they have a overlapping. And this overlapping part is the defined morphological traits which defines the genus Caribena. So each and every single species which needs to be within this genus Caribena does need to have these features. Uh, in Caribena, it is actually the fact that the urticating hairs on the abdomen are much longer and thinner than, for example, in other Avicularia species, and due to the fact that the urticating hair patch is somewhat shiny, as you see it in some Gormostola species. If there is now a new species described within this genus, at the moment there is none, but think about it, there is a third species coming to this genus Caribena. Then there is a third circle, and in the middle part, where all these circles match, there is still the genus definition. So I hope that this kind of information and explanation was uh, helpful to all of you guys. It has, by all means, it was not uh, intended to be scientifically accurate. I know there is so much more to discuss with you guys, but I wanted to keep it very simple and easy to understand. If there are more questions on, or if you like to see more videos like this, just leave a comment down below. I'll be happy to do more videos like this explaining stuff and uh, yeah, further illustrate with my awesome drawing skills um, certain topics. So again, disclaimer, that was not scientific at all, but it explains the, yeah, how or why we use uh, genus and genera to define a probable 
monophyletic group of uh, spiders which share all a common ancestor. That was it from today's video. We are going to see each other on Friday and of course next week again. Um, yeah, stay tuned and enjoy your week.